So I struggled for a really long time figuring out what I wanted to talk about. And that's because when I applied to do this, I didn't think it was going to get anywhere. And now I'm in a pickle. But I realized the other day that I know a lot of things and I don't know a lot of things. And right now I just want to speak on the things that I do know about. And one of the biggest things that's affecting me right now is being a person of color. And I know some people are going to be like, why do you always have to make it about race? Um, because I can and I will. Moving on. I've been a person of color all my life. All I've ever known was being brown. I come from a big Samoan family. And we're stupid and we're wild. And all we know is that we love each other and we respect each other. And we treat each other how we want to be treated. And so, growing up, the biggest thing for me was to find people who are like me. So when I started school, the first thing I did was look around to see if there was anybody who looked like me. And unfortunately, when you live in Olympia, Washington, you're going to see a lot of white people. And that's not an issue. Don't have anything against white people. Woo. So my first day of kindergarten, I was looking around searching for somebody who looked just like me. And I found a few people, but not a lot. And this happened literally my whole school career. And one of the places that really tested my identity was high school. This quote, I, if I could get this tatted on me, I really would. It says, high school is easy. It's like riding a bike and the bike is on fire and the ground is on fire and everything's on fire because you're in hell. And yeah, that's, that's really it. That's really how high school is. And for any upcoming freshmen, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it for you. I'll let you live that on your own. So I got into high school and I should have known it was sus because the first person I saw was a resource officer. That's really telling. So here I am, a freshman at Olympia High School. I know some friends from middle school, but they're older than me and we don't have any classes together. So I'm like, oh shoot, what, what am I gonna do? I actually have to go talk to people. And something that I found out is that my favorite conversations are with white students and teachers. They're my favorite. I, I love conversing with the Caucasians. It's my favorite thing to do. And it's because the range of knowledge is different. But the number one statement that I hear from them is, I'm not racist, but... What do you mean, but? You're either racist or you're not. <sighs> you know, it's always, I'm not racist, but I think all lives matter. I'm not racist, but I just don't think Mexicans should be in the U.S. I'm not racist, but I'm going to laugh at the fact that you just said that you're worried about your dad getting deported. And it's so funny to look back and to reflect on these statements. I'm not racist, but. You know, for somebody who's not racist, you spend a lot of time telling other people you're not racist. You shouldn't have to do that. Your actions should speak louder than your words. And when I'm having these conversations, I like to throw a little spice in there. I like to say, I can't be racist because I'm brown. That really gets them going. They, they could start a riot if they could, just off of that one statement. And that's what I solely believe. I believe that I can't be racist because I'm a person of color. And here's why. So we know that racism is prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism directed against a person or people on the basis of their membership in a particular racial or ethnic group, typically one that is 
a minority or marginalized. Yeah, that's like a no-brainer. Everybody knows that. However, there's different types of racism, and that's what people don't acknowledge. There's different forms of oppression. There's individual, there's interpersonal, there's institutional, and there's structural. So when people say that they're not racist, all I have to ask is, what kind of not racist are you? Are you not individually racist? Are you not interpersonally racist? Are you not institutionally racist? Or are you not structurally racist? Pick which one. And that, that puts a damper on the conversation because then I have to take a step back and realize that the education I've gotten is different from them. They will never know how it is to be in my skin. They will never know what it's like to have people run their crusty fingers through your hair because they're curious. And newsflash, that really hurts. Um, please, if you want to touch somebody's hair, please ask them because I would have caught a case by now just by the amount of people who keep touching my hair. So anyways, we're having this conversation and I point out examples of different forms of oppression just so that they get the gist of it. Let's take institutional, for example. Back when Ronald Reagan was serving his presidential career, or however you want to put it, he had a campaign called the War on Drugs. And this was following in the footsteps of Richard Nixon. Now, during the 80s, crack cocaine had just hit the streets and was wiping out black and Latino communities all over the U.S. You see, cocaine powder was associated with rich, rich white people. So in order to really target communities of color, Reagan was putting harsher sentences on cases that had crack cocaine. So if I was in possession of five grams of crack cocaine and a white person was in possession of a thousand grams of powder cocaine, I would go to jail longer than they did because powder cocaine was seen as a high-class drug. And so in the 80s, that's how they started to wipe out communities of color. They started taking away fathers and they started putting them in prison systems where they would eventually spend the rest of their life without the possibility of parole. I bring this up in the conversation and don't get a response back for a little bit. And then I hear, well, you can be racist. There's reverse racism. That's not a thing. Like, you want to be oppressed so bad. This is not the oppression Olympics. It's okay to not feel oppression. And I'm saying this to all my white kids and people. It's okay. We're not saying that you have to be oppressed. We're saying that you have a privilege that the rest of us don't, and that you should be using that to help others. <sighs> the amount of arguments that I've been into, you know, a good 80% of them turn out good, but then the 20% just turn out like this. We're just pointing at each other like, no, you're racist. I'm not racist, you're racist. No, I, I, don't, I don't think I'm racist. No, you're definitely racist. And I love having those conversations because I know that it goes in one ear and out the other, but nobody can say that I didn't say anything. It's not our job as people of color to educate other people, but it sure as hell helps. And that's what I do. I've gone to multiple school board meetings. I've met with lawmakers. I've been to protests. I've done just about everything under the sun in the name of social activism. And 
if I'm being quite frank, only about 50% of it actually works. And that's because you can't talk to people who aren't listening. But like I said before, you can't say I didn't say anything. And I want to take Olympia High School, for example. And I know my principal and the school board members are going to see this as a hit piece or a diss track. My bad. This is a photo from 1935. This is from Olympia High School. And one of my friends sent this to me, and I was like, dude, that's wild. Like, what? And then I, like, realized the year, and I was like, oh, that makes sense. But still, when the Black Lives Matter protests were gaining traction, our school district sent out a letter to everybody. And I mean, in, I mean this in the most respectful way, but that sounded like a YouTube apology. That sounded like fake tears and we hear you, we're just not gonna do anything about it. That's, that's what that sounded like. In order to fix all of the oppression, all of the racism, all of the homophobia, all of the sexism that goes on in schools, you have to acknowledge things like this, like blackface in a yearbook from 1935 that's public. I found this in like two seconds. And it's tiring. It's tiring having to talk about the same things to the same people and get a lot of, yeah, no, we hear you. We hear your story. Yeah, yeah, you're oppressed. <laughs> we hear a lot of that, especially being a part of the AAA club or the African American Alliance club. We do so much just to have equity and equality within our schools. And we get an email. That's how it is. We get an email that says we are actively working towards a better environment for our school. Where is that work at? Where is the better environment that you said you were going to give? Why is there a resource officer in a high school? Why are students of color giving up? Like, you really have to ask yourself that. I spent my whole life trying to figure out who I was, and then when I did, people didn't like that. So if staff members, if students, if adults who are white and who are in this area of Olympia, Washington, or anywhere in the world, you stereotype us and get mad at us for being who we are, then who do you want us to be? Because I will die before I ever cater needs to anybody who doesn't see me as a human being. And I think about my nephews, who are both two and three right now. And I think about their future. And I think about how they're going to go into high school and what it's going to be like for them. And it's sad because when I think about their future, I think about me sitting down with them, telling them how it really is. In middle school, they just told us that our grades were going to get lower and that homework was going to get more harsh and that lessons were going to get longer. But they didn't tell us that high school is a completely different breed. The society in high school is like if the internet and old people threw up everywhere. There's a lot of bias. There's a lot of judging, there is a lot of unnecessary laughing, there's a lot of fighting in the hall at 7.30 a.m. 
that's the type of stuff that I think that we should be preparing our kids for. Yes, academically things get tougher, but that's not the only thing that puts a damper on a kid's mental health. It's the people around them. I, if I had a dollar for every time I've heard the N-word in the hallway, I would just drop out of school at this point. And I know you're probably thinking, like, how do you know that it's a white person? If I go to a school that is like 80% white people, my guess is like my odds that that person is white is going to be pretty good. And if and it is. And I think it's funny, thinking back to that email, how we want to create a more safe environment for our students of color. But when Chad has the urge to say the N-word in fifth period, everybody gets a case of Helen Keller. Nobody can see. Nobody heard that. No, nobody even, well, I don't even know. I didn't even hear anything. That turn your cheek the other way attitude is how it is. And I think about high school so far, and I've met a lot of people who support me, but it's not enough. And it won't be enough for the incoming students, and it won't be enough for my nephews, and it won't be enough for the kids who come after them. Side note, I think it's funny. You know, racism is so funny to me. Racism cannot, like, you're not born racist, but somehow kids inherit it like it's a genetic trait. So I just want to take this time to talk to the adults and the teachers and the staff specifically. Kids will get away with anything you let them get away with. You might think it's just a word, but to somebody, that's their whole history. That's everything to them. In middle school, my PE teacher asked me if I was going to roast a pig in the ground. A pig in the ground. This is cement. How am I going to do that? But it's the small things like that. And then my ASL teacher, I mean, I love her. Shout out to Ms. Kreitz. Um, she asked me if I knew how to hula dance. I don't know how to hula dance because I'm not Hawaiian. And I know the islands are pretty close, but I am a loud and proud Samoan and I will be to the day I die. But that's just wrong, wrong island. I saw my best friend get cornered on a school bus by four adults when she tried to stick up for me. And these adults know who they are and they might have their own story, but I know mine and I know hers. Four adults on one student. How necessary do you think that is? Like two, fine, cool. I mean, you, you need one to talk and then the other one to just sit there on the walkie like this. But four? These are the things that, that people don't think about. How do you think she felt when four grown adults came to her on a bus? How do you think I felt when my PE teacher told me, are you going to roast a pig in the ground. I'm like, no, fool. I'm not going to roast a pig in the ground. There's a fully functioning oven. Sometimes I think people just say it just to say it. And I can't do anything about it. My voice is louder than anybody I know. But once I'm in a room full of lawmakers, full of school board members full of adults, full of teachers, my voice suddenly goes quiet and it gets drowned out 
by a bunch of, well, this student isn't trying hard enough. This, this student is just, this student's fine. This student was lying about them being hate crimed. I don't understand it. You want the title of not being racist, but you won't fight for it. You want the title of a diverse school, but you won't do anything about it. You'll let the resource officers follow the only kids of color to the bathroom. You'll let the teachers say racially derogatory terms in history class because that's a part of history. <laughs> You'll let kids like me apply for a TED Talk and let me get away with it. And I did. <laughs> And I promise there's an ending to all of this that is beneficial. To all my students of color, don't let them silence your voice. And it's easier said than done, but don't let them do that. That's your biggest weapon. That's the only thing that they really can't take away from you. I mean, they can't take away these hands, but I mean, you would get in trouble for that. And to all my teachers and adults, listen to the kids. I don't understand. If you can listen in the lunchroom to Barbara talking about how her son plays Ivy League football, you can listen to a student saying that they're hurting right now. You can listen to a student saying that this person offended them. And you may not understand it, but they do. Nobody expects you to understand pronouns, even though it's simple, even though it's simple, no, even though it's simple. We don't expect you to know everything. We just expect you to have our backs. And I understand it gets tiring some days. I would hate to babysit a bunch of high schoolers for like six hours a day, but you get paid for it. <laughs> and that's really all that I wanted to say. And that I hope that any student, whether you're of color or not, that you look around and you look at the people who are around you. I value everybody. And even if I don't like you, I still value you. And I will go on the streets and I will fight for your rights no matter what. I just hope that you do the same for me. Thank you.